Good morning. Good morning. It's great to see everyone this morning. If you'll stand, we're going to worship together. Well, good morning. You may have came in with no snow on the ground, but you will be leaving in a blizzard, it looks like. So, But you made it. You made it. You may have to stay here all night, so prepare yourselves. Well, it is good to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? There's just something about being able to come together and worship God together. How amazing that is. There are people right now that are doing this in secret because they don't have that freedom. So we are blessed. We are blessed. Well, I have a couple announcements, a couple things I've talked to you about before. Winter Jam is next Saturday. If you would like to be a part of the, the family group that is going, we are meeting at 2.30 in the parking lot um, close to Benner side. And we will be carpooling together, so if you want to come and then ride with someone else, that would be great. We'll all go up together. They will have concessions and everything there. It's $15 at the door. We may have to wait in line. Just prepare yourselves. But the teens are also going. This does not include them. They have their own way that they are going. So this is for anyone that's not part of Teens of Faith. This is for you if you want to go to Winter Jam. It will be a great time of fellowship and worshiping together. Also, Superstart is in March. Superstart is a preteen conference. It's geared towards preteens. We have limited amount of space. So if you have a fourth, fifth, or sixth grader that are wanting to come, go, talk to me if you have questions, but they need to register soon so they can guarantee their spots. All right. Well, I'm Pastor Jared. I get to give you a, a glimpse of what we discuss and talk about and Faith Kids on Sunday mornings. And we've been talking about a day at the museum. Before we get into muse museums, though, have you ever had someone tell you, well, you had to be there? You can't comprehend what they're, what they're laughing about, what is so great about it, because you weren't there, and they're making you aware. You had to be there to experience it. Experience is a big thing. There are even museums around, we have one just in Columbus, Coastside, is all about experiencing things. 
It's all about learning, but then experiencing what you're learning about. Like, for example, if you want to learn about static electricity, I need a volunteer that, is, does, that wants their hair completely messed up. No, we're not going to do that. But you can learn what static electricity does by doing things with a balloon, right? You learn better when you experience. And Jesus talks about experiencing as he is reading from a scroll in Luke chapter 4. He rolls out a scroll as he's in a synagogue and he reads, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. And he rolls back the scroll and he says, Today that has been fulfilled. And some of the audience that he was speaking to is in shock because he's saying, I am the Messiah to them. But he's also saying, you can experience all that the Bible has, all that it talks about, because of me. You can experience God's grace. You can experience God's love, his mercy, because of Jesus. It's not just something you learn about. You can experience it when you have a relationship with Jesus. So have you experienced that? Thank you. Well, good morning. We hope you've sensed a warm welcome inside the walls of this church, even though it's cold outside. But it is beautiful, I have to say. It is beautiful. And as I was driving in it this morning, I was thinking of the, um, the words, morning by morning, new mercies I see. And with that fresh, new fallen snow, um, I don't know, it just reminded me of that. So anyways, we're glad that you are here. And um, if you're visiting us with, for, with us for the first time, there are open the door cards in front of you if you would fill one of those out. Or if you are somebody that comes week after week, but you have something that you would just like the pastors to be aware of, um, fill that out and drop that in the offering plate as well. And uh, one of our pastors would be more than happy to reach out to you. Um, they can't know what we're going through unless we share with them. So that would be great. All right, I'm just going to share a few things in the bulletin this morning. Um, the first thing is the PDHC Baby Bottle Campaign is going on now through February 5th. And uh, that day's quickly approaching. So if you have not grabbed a baby bottle, either out here in the front or off to the side, um, do so and um, fill out um, a check if you still have those. I do, and my family makes fun of me for that. Um, but if you, or fill it with dollars or coins, silver coins is great, um, but they benefit greatly, and what a wonderful ministry that we have partnered with them, and so, um, but that's due February 5th. Um, Ladies Night Out is coming February 2nd, and we're going to Olive Garden, and that's always a fun time that we go and just sit and fellowship with women, um, and sorry men, but you guys have your times coming up here in the spring, I'm sure. But anyways, um, we enjoy that, and so if you'd like to join us, um, 6 o'clock, and get in contact with Sandy Walls about that if you have any questions. Another thing coming up is the Fame Breakfast, which will be Thursday, February 2nd as well. So that's a happening day, um, and that'll take place at 9 o'clock in the morning, and you guys are going to Frisch's. So if you want to join, uh, that would be great as well. And then finally, um, we have a group of five people that are headed to the Southwest Indian School um, to minister alongside of our own Doug and Becky Darfus. And those five are so excited um, about that. And I know our church family is just as excited for them and this ministry opportunity. Um, they um, are going to serve the kids of that um, Indian boarding school in somewhat like a vacation Bible school, 
But, and that's super exciting, and those, those five are gonna pour into those kids, but I also know that what's gonna be poured into our five, they're gonna be able to come back and share with us um, all that's going on. So um, if you would like to financially support them, they could use your financial support. Um, and so you would just make out a check to Faith Memorial Market Ministry Team. Um, if you want to make it to somebody specific, um, you would just get a name of one of the five that are going. Um, or you can do it through WGM. So that is quickly approaching. Um, but also, more importantly than that, is prayer support and just praying for them as they prepare to go and um, just all that God has in store for them because he already has that plan out for them. All right, that's all I have. If you would please stand and bow your head for a word of prayer, that would be great. Lord, we truly are blessed to be in your place this morning with people that um, pour into our lives and who we can pour into their lives. Lord, I thank you for um, every bit of this church. I thank you for the people. I thank you for the pastors. I thank you, Lord, for just being with us every step of the way. Lord, I ask that you continue to bless the things that go on in this church. I pray, Father, that they would be pleasing to you and that, Father, you would um, just share what you would have us to know and uh, speak through Jonathan this morning. Thank you for anointing him and bringing him to us. And I just pray, Lord, that you would open our hearts and our minds. Um, let the things that maybe are weighing on us be set aside so that, Lord, we can hear what you have to hear for us. Thank you again, Lord, for the morning by morning new mercies we see and help us to focus on those. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>
I think last week I forgot to invite the ushers forward. So ushers, would you please come forward? And we want to reverently bow in prayer at this moment. Thank the Lord for the obedience to the Holy Spirit in the hearts of people. And thank you for worshiping. I never cease to be amazed 
at the worship of this congregation. You bless my heart. I trust that you look around you and see your brothers and sisters worshiping the Lord. I trust you have felt his presence this morning in a special way. Let's pray together. God, through your son, Jesus Christ, we have redemption. And that's a great word. But there are so many things that we need to be set free from. And our redemption is not just a one-time thing, dear Father, but it is an ongoing process. You have re redeemed us from the power of sin. And as we walk through life, from time to time, we need your redemption. We need you to come again and again. We need to be released from some of the things that cause us to be less than a vibrant child of God. We need to know the power of your Holy Spirit working in and through us on a daily basis. We need to trust you more, dear God. We need to care for those around us. Jesus, we speak your name. We speak your name upon our families, dear Father. In spite of all that we have done, there are some that have never recognized the power of Jesus Christ in their life. We speak the name of Jesus. Lord, we know that you can't break down the power of our will, but we know that you can bring great conviction and great a great moving upon their spirit. And so we pray, we speak the name of Jesus in the lives of our family. Protect those, dear Father, that need special protection today. And dear Father, lift up those that need a special touch from you today. Lord, we speak the name of Jesus over those that we see around us day by day. God, so many are burdened down with the weight of sin. And we speak your holy name upon them. Thank you, dear Father, for your love and your grace and your mercy to us. And go with us through the rest of this service. Bless our pastor as he speaks. Be with the choir as they sing now, we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen.
Amen. Snow and all, I'm glad I came today, and I trust that you are as well. It's always good to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? And we are glad for His promised presence. We're looking today at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We'll start the reading with verse 10, and then we will read into chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians into verse 5. It's a lengthy reading, so if you would just please follow along. I know that we projected on the screen, but there's something about actually having the book. Amen. So make sure you have your book, have the Bible. We begin the reading in verse 10 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one would say you were baptized in my name. Now I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would be made void. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block, and to Gentiles, foolishness. But to those who are are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of, of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world, and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not, so that He may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. But by His doing, did you get that? But by His doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superior, superiority of speech or wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. That concludes the reading of God's Word. Gracious God, add, we pray, to Your Word 
by transporting it into our very spirits by your Holy Spirit. Speak to us, we pray, in the way that our spirits are able to perceive your spirit. We pray for your will to be accomplished in this moment and in this truth. In Jesus' name, amen. We don't, take, we don't take the time this morning to go through all the troubles of Corinth. Corinth was an interesting congregation, an often problematic congregation, and we're not going to dwell on that today. But we are going to recognize some of the factors that are a convincing reality to the Apostle Paul. We came across a phrase in both chapter 1, in the verses that we read, and certainly also in chapter 2, where we concluded the reading. And I want us to focus today on God's proven power. God's proven power. Let me state it again. God's proven power. Now, the Apostle Paul is ministering in an area, and we came across this insight, and we came across this rendering of the Apostle that coming into ministry in Corinth had its element of fear, had its element of intimidation and its element of concern. We need to understand how Paul is using that emphasis here. He is not saying he was afraid of the people or afraid of the setting. In fact, what he's afraid of is in any way being diverted from the core of his message. Because Corinth, in its very atmosphere, was a, was a city that loved debate. It loved the skill of argument. It loved eloquent speakers. They loved to gather. It was kind of sport for them to gather and hear someone articulate with great pomp and circumstance and eloquence some view. Then they would just wait for somebody else to pop up and say something totally different. They would believe it pr probably for about a nanosecond, and then someone else would speak, and they would think, oh, he has a good point. But the reality of all of it was it made no difference in their lives. So there was debate, there was oratory, there was skill, there was craftsmanship, and it was great in its, in its ability to kind of rouse one's senses, but it was basically just a flurry of activity. It was a bunch of noise, and nothing was accomplished. Kind of sounds like, kind of sounds like, kind of sounds like today. Bunch of flurry, someone bombastic, someone trying to argue their point and win the argument, but nothing changes in the outcome. It's not just a waste of time, and it's not just a waste of energy, but it's missing the point altogether. So the Apostle Paul said, I just had a fear entering into this atmosphere and entering into the setting that there would be any diversion on my part or drawing in of these antics by others for me to miss the point. Therefore, he says, I determined one thing, Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I'm sticking to it. I'm staying on course. I'm holding to this premise. I'm unmovable and I will do so with unflinching persistence and the power of God. I will declare this, Jesus Christ and Him crucified. But he also says he's aware of the fact of how that might be perceived. He's aware of who the message helps and upon deaf ears as well, the message falls. And he states something interesting. He says, the message, Jesus Christ and Him crucified, is to the Jews offensive because cursed is he who dies on a tree. So we know that it's a message that is just repulsive in a number of ways, and many Jews are not going to come to terms with the fact that this had to be in order for salvation to be made possible. They'll get hung up on the repulsive idea that in any way, shape, or form their Savior could die cursed. Then we have the Greeks. They'll look at it and say, this is weakness. 
He's a wimp. Who in the world could follow a wimp? Who in the world could follow someone who could be taken without fight and crucified on a tree? So he is foolishness. This is foolishness. The cross is foolishness to the Gentiles. And it is offensive. It's repulsive to the Jews. Now you think about that. In today's strategic world of marketing, which has not left the church untouched, if you know going in that a large portion of your audience is either going to consider your core message to be repulsive or foolishness, why preach it? Why preach it? In fact, many settings have decided against it. But here's what the Apostle Paul, and we need to hear this today, here's what the Apostle Paul cannot get away from and won't get away from. It is the power of God. I'm not going to quit preaching the cross. I'm not going to quit preaching this message. Why? It is the only demonstration and proof of real, unmitigated, divine power. And it is the power to transform. And it is the power to regenerate. And it is the power to sanctify. It is the power to redeem. I will not drop this message, for it is the power of God. So four times in the few verses that we read today, this phrase surfaces, the power of God the power of God. And for those that say this makes no sense, this is the wisdom of God. God in His wisdom, God in His perfect understanding knew that Jesus dying on a cross for the sin of the world made perfect sense. Amen. The world might scoff, the world might have struggle with it, but the cross of Christ is still the answer for the sickness of the soul known as sin. God's proven power. Way too many times we wilt in our faith. We look inwardly. We look at our own ability. We focus on our own strength while right around us, shining brightly, proven over and over again, is the power of God. I implore you today, do not sell the power of God short. Don't sell God short. Don't think He cannot transform you. For the Apostle Paul is giving that message today to us. It's the power of God. It's the power of God. God's proven power. We care more today about the power to wow than the power to win. The power to wow versus the power to win. We live in a world that is just absolutely enraptured by the wow. I watched a documentary. I won't tell you the focus of the documentary but I found it intriguing. It was talking about a fairly recent phenomenal global ministry, and I'll leave it at that. When many of the individuals who were interviewed made this statement, they said we would leave and walk out of the building, and several of them said this, and it was just like, well, it was wow. But then they asked harder questions, some of them. What's the long haul effect? What's the impact? And they came to the conclusion and their eyes were opened and they realized even in their own minds that they had followed something that was false. And they said we were just moved by the manipulative manner of the wow. But there was nothing won. Paul didn't care about the wow. He cared about winning souls. He didn't care about people walking out, wow. 
Did you hear that? No, he wanted to preach the unadulterated message. It is the power of God in Jesus Christ dying on the cross, shedding his blood to transform you and me. So he said, I'll preach this as long as I can. I'll preach Jesus Christ. I want to know one thing, Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So it's not power to wow, but power to win that matters. And I want us to pay attention to this. There are several degrees of winning. First of all, God has to get us awakened to the fact that we have been living a life that is displeasing to the God of this universe before whom we will eventually stand. Don't forget that. There is a God with whom you and I have to do. So whatever your age is, if you're able to morally understand anything, don't forget this reality. We will all stand before Jesus Christ, the righteous judge. We will all give an account. We don't hear a lot of that today, but that is a reality that ought to sober us every day. Not keep us somehow reduced in fear and cowering in the corner. I'm not saying that, but it is a good, wholesome, sobering thought. God aims to win us by winning our attention, awakening us to our lostness, and bringing us to an initial understanding of His saving grace through Jesus Christ. He aims to win us. Part of that is kind of winning over our attention, our focus, from ourselves, from the world, to Him. But eventually it goes far deeper than that. God aims to win in us. He aims not only just to win us over, to kind of get us introduced and bring us in, but He aims to win in us, in the inner person, in the inside being. He aims to win in us so that we no longer live by the inclination of fallenness, but we live by a new nature that is akin to His that we actually become partakers of the divine nature. He wants to win in us. He wants to win in you, and He wants to win in me. One of the ways that He does that is continue to bring the conditions to us that we recognize and that we understand, and that ultimately we are called upon to humble ourselves completely. We are called upon to give in without reservation to His will. We are called to die to ourselves in order to be fully alive unto Him. Amen. Amen. He aims to purify. He aims to cleanse us from our own rottenness. Is that clear enough? It's not power to wow, it's power to win. And God aims through the blood of Jesus and the power of His Spirit to claim us for all of His grand purposes. It's also not power to merely speak convincingly, but to speak for change, to speak for transformation. You know what? You can win the argument and a soul is unchanged. We don't care about winning arguments. I don't stand up here to, to beat down a straw man every Sunday. I'm not interested in you walking away and saying, well, he beat them up today. We're not here to win an argument. We know that our world is affected by sin. We see it every day. We're not here to win an argument because if we're here with, with the focus to win an argument, we will not win souls. The Apostle Paul's concern was, we're going out into a world and we're declaring the cross of Jesus and we're declaring a Savior who sacrificed for us because we are out to win souls. He who wins souls 
is wise. That's what the scripture says. Well, boy, we're, we're a quiet bunch today. I don't know exactly what that means, but I, I hope you're not asleep. It's not the, it's not the power to just convince the intellect. We're burdened for the change of soul. So it's not the power to wow that we care about or just to convince with our speech, but to change. And friends, Paul wasn't concerned with the power to perform, but to prove. Verse 4 of chapter 2, he says this, And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom. Now, he doesn't mean that we don't care about trying to persuade men because he'll say as well, we persuade men. What he's saying is this, we're not interested again, if we look at the context and if we look at how he's using this whole area of Corinth and their tendency, he says we're not concerned about just how precise and how convincing and persuasive our words might be. Rather, we are here to be evidence and proof. Demonstration is the word here. But in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. There is an irrefutable evidence that the devil cannot nullify and the world cannot dismiss. And that is the evidence of a changed life. You hear me? When somebody shows up to work and they say, you know, I've noticed something. You're a lot different. You don't talk the way you used to. Stuff's been really cleaned up, in your, even in your language, in your behavior. And I found out you're, you're, attend, you're, you're, you're attending church. Most of the time they don't say worship. Because we don't, a lot of folks don't understand that. They just think, you're going to church. I found out you're going to church. By the way, that's a good thing. You're not what you used to be. You're not meaner than a junkyard dog like you used to be. You're trustworthy. You're not just looking out for yourself. What in the world happened to you? Do you get this today? So the Apostle Paul is saying, who cares if we win the argument? Who cares if we are known for being great in our oratorical skill? The proof, the proof, the proof is a transformed life. And that is the demonstration of the Spirit and power. Amen. I'm saying these things to us today also, folks, that we will understand this. Not only is this the proof, not only is this what God does to prove Himself and to prove His truth and to enforce the gospel and to give credibility to this great truth so that the world may know, but it's also for you and me that we will understand the kind of power that is on our side for our good. And that we will not just limp around spiritually, barely making it. God help us. We have the power of God and the Spirit as our resource. So that everything God aims to do, He can deliver on it. He can deliver on His promise. Way too often, let me just tell you something, God is not... His arm is not shortened that He cannot save. God is not slack concerning His promises. If we are not encountering the over 
overwhelming, incalculable, incalculable grace of God. It's not God. The sticking point is us. So the Apostle Paul is reminding them, this is in the power of God and His Spirit. This is what God does. Don't stop Him short of what He wants to do in you. And don't say, I can't. We were talking about this in Sunday school this morning. What a travesty and a tragedy for us to say to God's can, can't. It's just that simple, friends. It's just that simple. I mean, I'm not that much of a brain, and I can figure that out. Ultimately, unbelief is saying to God's can, at least in my case, can't. And your can't can stop short God's can in your life. Don't do it. Paul says it's the power of God that we're talking about. It's the power of the cross we're talking about. It's the power of a Savior who perfectly, perfectly meets our need. And this whole thing was God's plan. Oh. Our hope, our grounding, our foundation is not in us. Thanks, thanks be unto God. It's in the power of God. It's in divine power. He's able. You know, we used to sing different songs. And they occasionally come back and kind of sweep out some of the cobwebs of my mind. But we used to sing, He's able, He's able. I know He is able. So what Paul's talking about is the power of God. I believe we miss that today. The power of God. If we focus on ourselves to somehow work hard enough on these texts to make them so, so, we will be nothing but frustrated, discouraged, depressed, downcast, despairing. But if we take God at His word and say, I submit myself to who you are and to your power, and I trust you to do in me what you have said Jesus has come to do. And if we will say, I know this, and God's okay to, for us to hold these things on Him. I know you're not a respecter of persons. If you've done this in anybody else's heart, you can do it in mine. You know what? The fact of one godly person on this earth means that God can make out of every one of us godly persons. Amen. We ought to rejoice in that. By His power and His Spirit. Thanks. That helps me. Just, it reminds me that you are there and you're not just cardboard images. You know, other people might be persuasive in their speech. They might be articulate speakers and be very gifted. But our hope, our simple yet profound, unmovable hope is in the power-packed message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The cross, the Christ, the change. That's what God aims to do by His power and His Spirit. And friends, I want to encourage you, don't stop. Don't halt in a differing opinion. Do not say to God's marvelous can what He can do. Do not say in your heart, sounds good, has some appeal. 
but can't. No, can. A glorious can. Amen. Four places in this text we are reminded it's not Paul, it's not the setting, it's not even that group of people, even though they had their issues to resolve and matters to make right, but the greatest highlighted factor of their faith depended on the power of God and His Spirit. And so it is today. Amen. Gracious Father, You know hearts. Gracious Spirit, You speak to hearts. My prayer for us today is simply speak, Lord, speak. Even as Samuel was reminded, speak, Lord, Your servant hears. May we hear You today. May we hear Your Spirit today. And if there is a step for us to take today toward You as the God who can, if we need to step out of our cannot, may we step by faith and Your grace today and by the power of Your Spirit, may we step into Your can for us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul expected response. We don't preach just to manipulate emotions and fill an altar, but we do preach the truth about which you and I always have to decide. So we have a place for that. I don't always say this, but we have an altar, a place that's set aside for us to pray. If there's a step that the Holy Spirit is making clear to you, you need to make today. Make the step. I know it can be intimidating. We won't do anything to you. We won't scare you. We'll just pray, pray with you. But there, are, there is often a step that God wants us to take. Take the step into His can. And don't stop Him with your cannot. Let's stand together as we sing.
it's been good to be in the house of the Lord. I trust that this has encouraged us to remember He can. He can. He can. It's not can doism. I just want us to note that before we leave today. I would never, ever preach to us. It is our can doism. We don't believe in bootstrap salvation, but we believe He can. Amen? He is certainly able to do what He said He will do. Oh, we need to just believe that and obey and walk in that. Well, this goes without saying, but I'll say it nonetheless. Be careful as you leave. Our good trustees try to keep things clear for you, but we don't control snow. So be careful as you leave. We'll pray in just a moment, but be careful. And if you need someone's assistance, take their assistance. But be careful as you walk and get to your car. And uh, remember, things are slower and slicker than normal. So be careful. As we close, we have folks to remember. Uh, Carly Bryant fell while snowboarding and broke her shoulder. So we need to pray for Carly. And then Dolores, uh, we need to pray for Dolores Schmelzer. She has, in the early part of February, some tests, some scans coming up, and we want to pray for her. And then they have a relative, Emily Blum. I think she's only 25, been diagnosed with cancer. We want to remember that need. And then uh, Dr. James Whetstone. We have a number of folks that have been in and out of the hospital in the last couple of weeks. Folks also waiting for surgeries, things of that nature. Plus, we know this. In every one of our lives, someone is without Jesus. And that should be burden and priority number one. We need to be light for them. Father, as we close our time of worship together, we thank You for Your presence. We thank You for Your truth. We pray, Father, that this won't be just where we walk out and think we've heard something interesting and compelling, but there is no change. We pray, O oh God, that we will not stop short of the message with its instruction without it becoming application in each of our lives. Thank you that you're as faithful today as you ever and always have been. You love us this day. We are marked by your unfailing love. You're in as much pursuit of us today as when David wrote Psalm 23 and said that very thing at the conclusion of that great psalm. You are in pursuit of us, and we praise your name. God, help us to believe wholly, completely in your promise of what you can do, not just for us, but in us. We pray for these needs that have been mentioned. We pray for the ongoing needs of many others. We also know that there's comfort needed with folks who are aware of timing and when a dear loved one passed from this life to the next. Be a God of all comfort, we pray. Then, Father, we also lift today our dear sister in the faith, Elisa Thomas. And Lord, we know that this week she will be off on her next assignment to Japan. We pray not only for protection and safety, but we pray, O oh God, for placement and usefulness. We pray that you would use her in the intersections of people's lives, whether those are co-workers or people she assists. We pray that her light that is a reflection of your light, will shine brightly. And we pray that you would use her as the presence of salt, flavoring that whole scene. Keep her, we pray, glad that she's been with us, and we pray your blessing upon her. Send us from this place safely to go into the world to be help to someone who needs Jesus the Christ. In His holy name we pray, amen, amen. May God go with you 
His Spirit guide you. You are dismissed. Thank you.